a very good morning all of you all of my indian friends and a good afternoon to all of my southeast asian uh, friends and colleagues uh, we have got a very mixed uh, group of participation uh, from uh, a lot of, uh, uh, of my indian colleagues and uh, many of our customers and friends uh, from as far east as philippines malaysia thailand so it's a very mixed crowd we have some of our colleagues from europe they have got up very early uh, today morning and uh, they are attending this so uh, welcome you all for this uh, the session the webinar there is a famous expression in english when the going gets tough the tough get going we are all getting tough aren't we well the current situation of covid 19 has taken us through the classic curve of change we all have been in a state of shock followed by resistance to the change then exploration of finding new ways of adapting with the change and finally we are showing acceptance to live with this new reality i'm dr raina raj head of marketing natural remedies private limited i would be the moderator for this webinar we are all really thankful to all of you for taking your precious time to join this webinar. This webinar is presented to you by Natural Remedies Private Limited. Our journey started way back in 1950s. Our founder, Mr. Ramlal Agarwal, was a renowned expert in identification and collection of herbs. He was fascinated by the ancient Indian system of Ayurvedic medicine. This legacy was continued by his son, Mr. R. K. Agarwal, by setting up a small scale research and development facility in Bangalore, in India, in 1970. As our business started expanding, uh, it fostered the need for a bigger and better research facility. In 1996, our existing R&D center got transformed into a best-in-class facility with modern technology and latest laboratory instruments. Currently, under the eminent leadership of our MD and CEO, Mr. Anurag Agarwal, and our Director of Commercial, Mr. K. Narendra Reddy, Natural Remedies has become India's number one herbal animal healthcare company. Our products are being used in more than 30 countries worldwide. We are very proud to say that we are a local organization in India, which has become a global brand now. Thank you for being vocal for local. Natural is Future is a webinar series in which we will try to provide solutions to your daily problems related to animal farming. We have with us today, Dr. Sudito Haldar, Dr. Sudipto Haldar is the Director of Research and Development Wing of AgriVet Consultancy Private Limited, a Kolkata-based organization which provides research and nutritional consultancy to its partners worldwide. He is a veterinarian with master's and PhD in animal nutrition with total 18 years of experience in our industry. Dr. Haldar is also the author of 70 peer-reviewed and popular articles based on his researches in the field of animal health and nutrition. A warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you very much. To make this webinar interactive, there are options for chat, questions, and polls on your screen. If you are using a laptop or a desktop, you can see these options on the right side of your screen. If you are using a mobile phone, you can see these options if you scroll down. If you want to introduce yourself or give any suggestions, please use the chat option. If you want to ask questions, please use the questions option. I would like to repeat, if you are using a laptop or a desktop, you can see the chat, questions, and poll options on the right side of your screen. If you're using a mobile phone, 
you can see these options if you scroll down if you want to introduce yourself or give any suggestions please use the chat option if you want to ask questions please use the questions option you can ask your questions anytime during the webinar and we would be really happy to answer all of your questions during this webinar or through your email at the later time today Dr. Sudipto Haldar would be enlightening us about how to optimize poultry production during COVID-19 era. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Rana. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again, Dr. Raina, for giving me this opportunity to discuss a very pertinent issue that is haunting everybody in the present day. This COVID-19 pandemic, a situation that has emerged in the last uh, six months, we, we perhaps could not even think of in our nightmare that, that such a situation will come. And we have to face this sort of situation in our life forever. This is really, this is really a a messy situation that we are going through and we are really sometimes we we feel sort of you know heartbroken that what is going to happen what will be our future perhaps we are all finished now probably that may not be the actual situation that we are thinking about yes there is no doubt that this pandemic, this COVID-19, this has brought about a paradigm shift in the supply, demand and prices of commodities, especially the food items. I just want to draw your attention to some of the figures, like there is a 4% increase in the meat and poultry production. The eggs, they have become three times more expensive. And there is a 14% increase in the retail fresh produce volume sales. And this has happened despite a 42% decline in the total restaurant transactions. This data, this data has been obtained from a UK-based statistical survey. And the data, it covers a period from, say, February till middle of May. Now, this situation, this situation is uh, perhaps I'm oversimplifying the interpretation. But my point of interest is that, that probably this situation will prevail for some time just because of number of factors. For example, in India, I think uh, after a long gap, the broiler meat price is soaring up. The egg prices are quite stable. The raw material prices are quite soft, especially if we consider the price of corn right now. So after a long time, the broiler farmers and the layer farmers, they are, they are feeling some sort of you know a comfort. A level of comfort has come up in their mind. I'm not sure that how long this comfort will continue because there are so many factors present in controlling the market in controlling the prices of the products and controlling the prices of raw material as well as the commodities. But this is a situation and this situation, we can consider this situation as a blessings in the form of disguise. Now, there is no doubt that the end of pandemic, this COVID-19, it has severely affected almost all the area of a poultry farming operation. It has affected the supply chain operation. It has severely affected the technical services and the major impact was on the human resources because the social distancing, the fear psychosis of getting the infection very quickly from others, all these factors that has led to put a good number of workers, including the skilled managers, the skilled laborers of their duty and this is going to impact the performance of any operation. And this poultry industry is not an exception to this gender rule. Now, this is a crisis moment. We know that this is a crisis moment and we have to come out of this crisis. So there is no other way but to increase the efficiency of the operation. The efficiency needs to be improved. Efficiency has to be improved. And the enhancement in efficiency should be at all the points of an operation of a poultry business. And the main objective of from now onwards should be to increase the efficiency 
to spend less input so that the maximum output can be achieved and the profit can be maximized. Now, one thing which is haunting me right at this moment is that this pandemic may affect the feed quality because of mycotoxin buildup. Now, why, why I'm apprehending this mycotoxin buildup? The, the question is quite relevant. But if we consider the situation which has been prevailing for the last couple of months or so, and the condition which is prevailing right now, perhaps my apprehension will come true. For example, there was lockdown, there was severe manpower shortage, the transportation were come to an uh, come come to a standstill. So there was a possibility that there will be storage, prolonged storage period for the raw materials, prolonged storage period for the feed. The feed and the raw materials are stored in the warehouses. And now these stored raw materials and the feed materials are being released gradually to reach the feed milling plants or to reach the poultry farms. Now at the same time, if we consider the situation, now the new corn has come up. The new corn, as usual, it contains high level of moisture, 15, 16, 17, 18 percent moisture. Now, this corn, if this corn is not treated properly, not processed properly, or not being handled properly, uh, and being exhausted in a quick succession, there is a huge possibility that this corn will lead to the development of the mycotoxin just because of the mold buildup and the facility the mold will get out of this environmental condition to turn into mycotoxins. Here, another point is very important. That is the situation which we are going to face for the next three or four months. This next three or four months period, this June, July, August till the end of September, uh, this period, this period is considered to be as the monsoon season in India. Uh, and this period is characterized by high ambient temperature, high relative humidity, both high relative temperature, high, high, high temperature and humidity, both. And this is a situation when a lot of problems, for example, wet litter becomes a major issue. The situation is quite simple. The situation is quite, quite, quite simple, I should say. Why it is quite simply explainable? Because of the high ambient temperature, the birds will try to get rid of the extra heat. They will start panting. But unfortunately, because of the high relative humidity, the evaporative heat loss by means of panting will not take place properly. So just to get rid of the extra heat, what the birds will do? The birds will simply move to the drinker. They will drink a lot of water just to get rid of, just to, just to get them cooled down. Now, excessive drinking of water is not really good always because that, that stretches the small intestine, that leads some sort of negative impulses to the satiety center and that depresses the feed intake. At the same time, what happens, you know, that this water passes very easily. It increases the digester transit time. And as a result, food passage, sorry, it, 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 it yes, it, it reduces the digester transit time and it increases the digester passage rate. As a result, what happens there, you can observe a huge amount of feed passage and wet litter. So the problem, what, we should face now is that high ambient temperature, high relative humidity, and at the same time, this wet litter problem. Now, one of the ways to reduce this uh, wet litter problem or this stress on the birds is just to reduce the stocking density. But right at this moment, when the farmers are just enjoying some amount of profit, advising them to reduce the stocking density should not be should not be a good one, a good option. So, stocking density reduction. Uh, is not possible right at this moment. But we know that wet litter problem is a big problem which ultimately leads to you know, clinical or subclinical coccidiosis or dysbacteriosis and necrotic enteritis. So ultimately, these are the points which must be kept in mind in order to maximize the profit uh, from a broiler farming operation. So how to deal with this situation? The situation is difficult, I understand but there are ways out. For example, if the ventilation can be improved by any means, that will give some sort of chill effect on the bird. Now there, in, in, in closed housing system, absolutely there is no problem except for the humidity in the tropical climatic condition. But in the open housing system, the ventilation is a point that needs to be kept in mind. The ventilation can be improved by means of uh, 
some sort of stirring fans which can which can which can put the air which can which can force the air at certain angles on the bird surface and that can take away some amount of fit and humid air from the bird surface and the bird will feel comfortable so that will increase the feed intake and finally that ultimately reduce the wet litter incidences of the wet litter at the same time there should be some dietary intervention the dietary intervention should be directed in such a way that some non specific diarrhea can be prevented there are a lot of you know additives available in the market these additives can be used and these additives can effectively reduce the non specific diarrhea and can reduce the problem of wet litter to a great extent now this mycotoxin mycotoxin uh, as i'm apprehending that mycotoxin will be a threat indeed it will be a threat to uh, to a great extent and there will be multiple you know multiple multiple effects for these toxins now generally there are huge number of mycotoxins which can be present in a feedstuff I, i'm just showing here say five or six mycotoxins now this five or six mycotoxins these are quite important for example aflatoxin is there ochlatoxin petrolin fumonazin blah 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 now these mycotoxins they do have a number of effects we can see the heterotoxic effect very easily we can see the nephrotoxic effect also very easily the kidney becomes swollen the kidney becomes hyperemic the liver gets pale and enlarged so whenever we do post mortem we can see that yes this may be the chances of the uh, toxicity in the birds but one effect generally which we cannot see directly in our naked eyes that is the immunotoxic effect of the mycotoxins and this is quite interesting that all the mycotoxins i have mentioned here and frankly speaking all other mycotoxins also they have huge immunotoxic effect that means they reduce the immune responses of the bird and more interestingly all these mycotoxins they have interactions with each other for example aflatoxin is having interaction with t2 t2 is having interaction with dawn fumonazine is having interaction with ochlatoxin and and so on and so forth so this will be there will be a sort of cascade of actions and all the cascade of actions ultimately will impact the immune function of the bird so if there is even a chronic depression in the immunity that may lead to huge impact on the performance of the bird and this problem is going to be particularly important for the laying hens as well as the parent stock because these hens are reared for a long period of time for example the laying hens they are being reared for 100 weeks almost and if these hens are consuming even a low quantity of toxin for say around 30 40 weeks we can't even imagine that what should be the consequences what may be the consequences okay because you know these are all cumulative effects these toxins are metabolized the metabolized may get excreted and some metabolized may get accumulated in the body and finally whatever we are going to get at the end of say at the feeding period is accumulation of the toxin so longer the exposure time the greater will be the risk <clears throat> now generally we judge the quality of our grain or particularly for corn on the basis of the quantity of aflatoxin which is present there but we overlook two very important mycotoxins one is dawn and another one is fumonazine because their effects are not really visible in the naked eyes but these two mycotoxins when they are present together they may severely impact the immune system and the and and the impact is far more if the baby chicks less than 7 days of age they are exposed to even a low level of mycotoxin especially this dawn and fumonazine the main impact is on the gastrointestinal tract function and the immune system so finally we can we can say from here that if we are not very much sure about the quality of the mycotoxin in terms of the uh, quality of the quality of the grains in terms of mycotoxin so we are exposing our stock to a huge risk so we we this is this is a regular phenomena because it is not that the monsoon month is coming this time only uh, the hot and humid climatic condition is coming this time only this is a regular phenomena we are we are we are accustomed to all this all these incidences Uh, from the very beginning of our of our of our business operations but the point is that since there was some disruption in the movements and there will be some disruptions in the workforce just because of this social distancing norms and all these things 
So there is a possibility that the raw materials, the fixed stuffs will get accumulated, will get uh, piled up in the warehouses, will, will not be consumed in a, in a, in a rapid pace. The entrepreneur may, may purchase a big amount of raw materials for a long period of time. So my, my intention is just to remind you that, well, these are all well accepted steps. Anybody can do this one. Anybody can do this one just to take the price advantage. But the point is there should be proper precaution. The precaution must be there so that the mold growth can be prevented. The fungus tests are performed on a regular basis. And whenever there is, there is an incremental level of fungus found in the raw materials, uh, there should be some precautionary measure. For example, dilution of the infested corn with some fresh corn or like that. Anyway, that's a different part of the story. Now, what I was saying that mycotoxins, they primarily affect the gut functions. This is interesting, you know, that the mycotoxins, they reduce nutrient absorption. They hamper with the barrier function. Barrier function means that if we consider these cells of the intestinal mucosa, so these cells are bound together by means of some tight junction proteins, which work as a cementing substance. So the mycotoxins, they specifically work on those tight junction proteins. They eat on these tight junction proteins. And as a result of this, the barrier function is disrupted to a great extent. What happens? What is the consequence? If the barrier function is disrupted, then if any mild infection is also present there in the, in the luminal side of the small intestine, if say, for example, a very mild load of pathogenic E. coli is there, so these pathogenic E. coli and their metabolites will pass into the systemic circulation. And accumulation of these pathogenic metabolites will lead to cyst septicemia in the near future. So this is one of the one of the grave consequences of mycotoxin infestation of raw materials and feed. The so nutrient absorption. Most of the mycotoxins, they impact the nutrient absorption in a negative manner. So the birds do not get enough of nutrient if mycotoxin is there in the feed. And one of the consequences of the mycotoxin infestation is a reduced feed intake. Now, there are some effects on the immune functions of the mycotoxin. They lead to cell proliferation. That means just as a defense mechanism, the mucosal membrane that starts proliferating. And this cell proliferation is coupled with an enhanced synthesis of the cytokines and the immunoglobulins. So cell proliferation, cytokine and immunoglobulin synthesis, these are all defense mechanisms. And these defense mechanisms, they eat up a huge quantity of the nutrients which is being consumed by the bird. So on one hand, the birds are not getting enough of nutrients just because of, as, because of a direct effect of mycotoxin. And on the other hand, the birds is losing, the bird is losing a lot of nutrients just to just 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 as an immune mechanism, immune defense mechanism. So that means here also negative balance and here also negative balance. And this is coupled with a disrupted barrier function. So that means the bird is exposed to a lot of pathogenic load. So that is going to impact the bird's performance to a huge extent. And this condition is going to be aggravated during the hot summer months because there is possibility of lipid peroxidation unless and until uh, some specific dietary strategy is taken uh, to control or just to keep the lipid peroxidation of the mucosal cells to keep under control. My point of interest here is to maintain the health of the small intestine of the birds during the coming months so that barrier function is maintained, nutrient absorption is maintained to a proper, lo proper level, and the immunity is not exacerbated in any way. So if we if we if we conclude the this particular part of how this mycotoxin load is going to impact the bird's performance during this post-COVID era, we should we should say that a couple of points are very much important. Raw material selection and raw material purchase must come from the quality norms. Must come from the quality norms because that means there should be a defined norm for the toxin and the molds as well as for the moisture. And if the quality norm is not maintained. In that case, there should be direct rejection. And at the same time, the breach in the biosecurity cannot be, cannot be encouraged in any way. Because if there is any sort of breach in biosecurity that is inviting a pathogen into the 
broiler house or into the layer house. Now, these are the two points which may be affected to some extent just because of this social distancing norms as well as shortage of the workforces. However, this is this is these are the areas where all the entrepreneurs should work on and should come up with some strategies by which uh, these two factors can be taken due care of. Now it's the time for polling, Dr. Rana. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for the first segment uh, where we have clearly understood the possible problems associated with a rattled supply chain leading to an impending right. mycotoxin problem and uh, right. how the gut health of the birds can get affected. Thank you so much sir, for that, sir. Before going into the next segment, uh, I would like mm -hmm. to invite the attention of the uh, audience uh, towards a poll question. On the right side of your screen, you can see a poll question. Uh, so the question is, do you think a healthy start of chick's life will yield good productivity? Cycle? You can answer yes, no, or not sure. Uh, you can take 10 seconds of your time. And by the time this poll question is, is answered, we can go back to Dr. Sudipto Halda's presentation uh, and we can continue from there. Great. Uh, sir, I, th I think uh, there is uh, almost a one sided uh, response around close to mm -hmm. it is still counting, but five people think that there is a healthy uh, you know, start of a chick's life will have a good positive impact on the productivity. Uh, there are 3% of the people who are saying not sure. So that will give you some mm -hmm. insights sir, about how the audience feels. Up to you. Over to you, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. This early chick management, early chick management is always special early chick management this management I, i'm talking about the I, i'm talking about a comprehensive approach for this early chick management it basically starts from the hatchery uh, to be honest it basically starts from the parent parent farm where from the where from where from the eggs are being transported to the hatchery and then in the hatchery there are a lot of steps where the eggs are being handled properly and finally the eggs are stored eggs are set in the incubator and the chicks come out so Basically, if we if we consider a layer farming operation or a broiler farming operation, we, we see it from the hatchery. But in reality, it starts uh, much before, much before in the parent stock it's, uh, itself. A lot of factors are involved there. You know, uh, I, I don't want to I don't want to discuss all the factors because that will take a long time. But anyway, in a very 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 brief manner, I should I should say that how this pandemic. And the associated disruptions in in workforces, associated disruption in you know uh, availability of the transports, everything that may that may impact the quality of the chicks. I'm not considering the quality of the eggs. I assume that the chick, the eggs received in the hatchery are properly maintained. They are they are uh, properly incubated, and finally the chicks, healthy chick, uh, healthy healthy chicks are coming out. The point is that just because of number of factors, these factors may be less demand in the market these factors may be uh, because of you know the lack of skilled workforce or maybe due to shortage of the manpower there is a possibility that after the hatching the chicks are hold in the hatchery for a longer period of time longer period means unusually longer it is difficult to define that what is that unusually longer period but this is somewhat longer period than than what we experience uh, under natural conditions the main problem which is going to happen during this particular period of time is dehydration. The dehydration, dehydration will take place, will set in, in the cheeks if the cheeks are hold in the hatchery for an unusually long period of time because the cheeks have very limited water reserves. The problem is if a cheek arrives a farm under dehydrated condition, it cannot give its full genetic potential. That is the main problem. To have a good start, the chicks must not be dehydrated. The point is, in situations where the environmental temperature is more than 40 degrees Celsius, relative humidity is very high, in that case, the baby chicks, they also pant. And they lose a huge amount of water just because of panting. The point is, this, is, this, this dehydration becomes so severe 
that within 24 hours after after hatching the chicks may lose around 5 to 10 grams of body weight generally the the rate of loss in body weight is around 2 grams if i am not wrong but but in in severe cases of dehydration up to 10 grams of body weight can be lost by a chick under under this high temperature and humidity so the point is that chicks must be weighed immediately after they reach the farm there should be some idea about what was the weight of the chicks at the time of the hatching and if it is found that the weight loss loss is too high then we should we should we should think that well dehydration has taken place and if the chick is dehydrated to be honest there is a uh, least possibility that they can be revived properly to get rid of this problem absolutely um, to the to the to the fullest extent now there is another point that we observe that leg abnormalities so these are very common findings you know these are very common findings we always observe generally we overlook or unless and until this this these numbers reach a fairly high amount we we love to ignore these problems we generally take some sort of you know uh, temporary measures for example if these conditions are observed splayed leg conditions are observed we generally think that well this might be due to some sort of calcium phosphorus imbalance there must be some vitamin imbalance and mineral imbalance we just treat the situation by means of some oral calcium phosphorus solutions or vitamin mineral solutions etc etc and uh, we see that yes the condition is rectified honestly speaking if this type of condition is observed say within 48 72 96 hours of age after the hatching then this can hardly be related to nutrition issues they can hardly be related to nutrition issues because the nutritional imbalance is most unlikely to take place during this early phase of life. The chicks are receiving their nutrients from the yuck itself up to 40 hours. And the yuck is the most balanced feed for the chick. So how the nutritional imbalance will take place? The most of the this most of the most of the most common reason for this plate leg conditions should be some sort of you know injury to the to the to the legs at the time of handling at the time of transportation or at the time of handling at the farm or there must be some problem with uh, with the floor of the brooding house we generally use newspaper we generally use some sort of plastic sheets or something like that for the brooding purpose but practically these plastic sheets or the or the or the newspaper they do not provide enough of static friction for the legs of the baby chick as a result of which the, the, the legs slip out and they suffer from this type of conditions. And if this condition occurs, then even in bigger chickens also, that will be there. And since we are talking about increasing the efficiency of operation, so these are very petty points, very, very minute points, which love to ignore but we need to take note of these points because if these points are not being taken care of, then that will give a poor start. And if a poor start is there, we cannot get, going to get, we cannot, we, we are not going to get uh, the desired level of performance at the time of the harvest. Another point is the sooner the chicks receive the feed, the better it is. This is very much important. This is very much important. Why this is important, you know that the yolk, we, we, we had, uh, or rather we, we, we have an idea that yes, the yolk is there. So yolk can, yolk can provide sufficient quantities of energy and protein to the baby chick. And so they can survive. Yes, true, they can survive. And they do survive on the, on the nutrients, which is on the nutrients which are present in yolk. But these, these, these nutrients which are present in yolk, that is not to, not for the growth and development of the chicks. These nutrients of these biomolecules, they are rather intended for transferring the passive immunity to the bird, which is which is which is coming from the hen. So if this yolk, instead of providing or transferring the passive immunity to the baby chick, if it is being wasted for the growth and development of the bird, does it make any sense? It doesn't make any sense. To be honest, it doesn't make any sense. Moreover, the nutrients which are present in the yolk that doesn't support the growth of the intestine and that doesn't support the growth of the immune organs but but this is 
very much necessary. The growth of the small intestine and the growth of the immune organs, this is very important and that, that must take place within a very short period of time. So the primary objective should be to provide the chicks with feed as quickly as possible. If we expect that there will be some sort of uh, unwarranted delay in transferring the chicks from the hatchery to the farm, steps should be taken. A lot of, lot of products are available nowadays. Some jelly-like substances are there which are rich in nutrients, which are rich in some amount of uh, water. So those should be provided in the chick boxes so that the chicks can survive. Chicks can get some nutrients at least during the time of the transit. And as soon as they reach the farm, just give, say, a couple of hours for them to be adjusted and offer the feed. <clears throat> so the sooner we receive, we, we, we give the feed to the birds, the chicks, the yolk is absorbed quickly and maternal antibody, antibody is transferred to the chick and we can get a good start. And if we get a good start, there is no, no confusion that if we can maintain this, this tempo, then we can get a good finish as well. Just have a look at these two pictures. So here, <clears throat> this is a condition when the chicks were given feed, access to feed immediately after hatching. So these are nothing but the villi, villi on the present on the mucosal surface of the small intestine. So these are the villi and these are, these are the villi, the disposition of the villi for a chick which was given access to feed immediately after hatching. And this is the same villi for, for the chicks which were given access to feed 48 hours after hatching. That means these chicks kept fasted for 48 hours after hatching. <clears throat> Just see the difference in the disposition and distribution of the villi in these two chicks. Here the villi are so compact, so closely situated and here the villi are sparsely distributed. There are big gaps between the, between the villi. So we can expect that the total amount of the absorptive surface area that will be much more in this case than that in this case. And it has been observed that if the amount of feed offered is delayed by 48 hours, there may be approximately 8 to 9 percent drop in the final body weight. That means if I'm going to get say around 2.5 kilograms, I'm going to get at least 200 to 300 grams less body weight at the end, which is not at all desirable, at least during this period when we are talking about increasing the efficiency at every step of production. So this is a very crucial step and this needs to be kept in mind <clears throat> very meticulously. Now, the selection of the diet and selection of the raw material, that is going to play a big role in getting a good start. Let's consider a very basic raw material, corn. We generally consider corn as the best of the raw materials, which can provide good amount of energy, fairly good amount of energy. Rather, it is, it is considered to be the main source of energy for our chicken diet. And where from this energy comes in case of corn? The energy comes from the starch present in corn. The point is, the starch content is quite constant in corn, but not the starch digestibility. The starch digestibility is quite variable. It varies from 25% to 56%. This is, this is a big variation. Similarly, if we consider the protein meals, keeping aside the soybean meal, the variability in digestibility of protein is quite high. For example, fish meal. The variability in protein digestibility is more than say 10%. For say poultry meal, it is more than 6%. That means if the digestibility varies in this way, if I expect the digestibility of say fish meal will be around 80%, it may be as high as 90% or it may be as low as 70%. These variations are not at all good. We need to be, uh, we, we need to, we need to, we need to, program the, the, the diet in such a way that it contains highly digestible raw materials so that the so that the chicks can digest them easily. They can extract the maximum amount of the nutrients from the given feed so that they get the maximum benefit out of that. But if these variations take place, if I get a consignment of corn where the digestibility of starch is at the bottom level, or if I get a consignment of 
say fish meal, I use fish meal and I get a consignment of fish meal where the variability in protein digestibility is so high, then my entire dietary regime is going to be impacted a lot. I'm not going to supply the desired quantity of digestible nutrients to my chicks. And if that is the case, then I should not expect a good performance, a good start from the baby chicks. Fortunately, we have a number of good enzymes. We have the phytases, we have the carbohydrate demanding enzymes, we have the protease, we have NSPs, and blah, blah, blah. So these enzymes should be used in a very strategic manner. The main objective of using this enzyme is to reduce these variations. Whatever variations we are observing here, whatever variations we are observing here, these variations must be, these variations can be handled nicely by the enzyme application. One of the problems of these variations of the lower digestibility is the feed or the nutrients, they pass undigested to the hindgut. And if the nutrients pass undigested to the hindgut, they become the substrate for the bacterial growth. There are a good number of bacteria present in the ileum and cecum. And a good number of these bacterial population, they are potential pathogens. If by means of supplying this undigested nutrient to them, we, we facilitate their growth. So there is a possibility that the potential pathogens will start proliferating. And finally, they will impact the intestinal health of the birds. Now, since we are discussing about the impending threat of mycotoxins, the, the likely problems we are going to face during this hot and humid climatic condition, if these these are coupled with uh, lower digestibility feed. In that case, the situation will be further confounded. Further confounded. So the objective of the dietary regimen should be, or you can say that the objective of the enzyme application should be should be to shift the site of digestion from the hindgut to the anterior gut. If the site of digestion can be handled, can be can be can be, can be shifted from the hindgut to the anterior gut, in that case, what will happen? The bacteria will not get enough of substrate for their proliferation. They will be starved out. And finally, the microbial dynamics will shift from dysbiosis to ebiosis. So that will be the primary objective for any feeding regimen during any period of time. And especially during this period when we are talking about increasing the efficiency to a good extent. Now, again, there is time for polling, Dr. Rana. Uh, thank you, sir, for the second segment of the presentation. Uh, sir has uh, very well laid out the one of the most crucial uh, points in, in poultry farming, and that has become even more crucial uh, in this COVID-19 situation, the early life of the chicks. So before going to the next segment, sir, um, uh, I would like to request the attention of the audience towards the poll questions. So this is related to the next segment that we'll be talking about. The question is, what is your choice of additives used for water sanitation? Any medications that you use for improving the water quality? What, did, what would be your choice? The choices are hydrogen peroxide, acidifiers, chlorine tablets, or any others. You'll have uh, 10 seconds to uh, answer uh, this poll question. And once it is answered, we will quickly go back to uh, the next segment of uh, Dr. Sudeep Haldas presentation. Okay, so we are, sir, we are getting some interesting insights. Around 57% uh, of our audience feels they choose chlorine tablets. 22%, mm -hmm. sorry, 31% of the people uh, believe that they go for acidifiers, and around 11% mm -hmm. of that they will go for hydrogen peroxide so that would that right, yes yes that, that's quite interesting interesting polling yes so let's discuss something about 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 this situation and let's see that if we can find the answers in the subsequent slides and if we if we do not if the audience doesn't get the answers then anyway we are ready we are, we are here to discuss about these points okay so let's move there so basically this water quality is always very much critical for a good performance to achieve. Unfortunately, this is perhaps misunderstood, less understood, or even sometimes neglected. Uh, the point is, we really sometimes 
grope in darkness about how to judge the quality of water. What are the parameters? What what are the specific? For example, for raw materials, we we, we set some sort of parameters like this should contain this much of protein. This should contain not more than this much of moisture. The fiber content should be like that. Blah blah blah. So many parameters are fixed for the raw materials. For the finished goods also, we fix a minimum amount of protein, calcium, phosphorus, and so on and so forth. But what about water? But water is very much critical, very much crucial for a good start, for a good sustenance of any flock. Unfortunately, we sometimes get confused, and many a times this happens that. Uh, we have to take decisions uh, out of you know that ignorance, and uh, if we consider that this pandemic will create some sort of pressure on the entrepreneur to put some of his workforces off the duty uh, on a regular basis, or even to shed off his workforce, and 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 he needs to run his uh, show with some sort of semi-skilled or unskilled workers, the problem associated with water quality is going to be aggravated far more now let's have uh, some discussion about how to how to consider water as a as a safe one anyway so these are the physical parameters basically so there are a lot of parameters and one of the parameters is very much very much important that is that is the ph of the water so this is this is for the general water for the drinking purpose general water for drinking purpose the ph should be like that only there should not be there should not be certain amount of zinc there should not be certain amount of lead and and there are so many parameters anyway so these these parameters are available anywhere and we can we can judge the quality of water based on the analytical report of water and and can grade the water for safe or unsafe for drinking now most important point so far as the poultry farming is concerned is the quality bacteriological quality of water the bacteriological quality is extremely important so if we if we discuss the bacteriological quality there should not be any coliforms. The coliform count should be zero. The aerobic mm -hmm. plate counts, that means the total number of the bacteria, aerobic bacteria, which can proliferate in presence of air, that should be also zero. Yes, we can accept, say, up to 1,000 colony forming units per ml of drinking water. We can accept up to 50 colony forming units for total coliforms, but they are not desirable. And there should be zero E. coli, there should be zero pseudomonas, and there must not be any fecal coliform because these three bacteria they are highly pathogenic they have the they have they have high potency to create a huge pathogenicity if they enter into the bird's system so these are the bacteriological parameters and these bacteriological parameters should form a guide for any poultry farming operation now let us consider that what what how to how to actually judge the quality of water now see there are three farms <clears throat> a b and c now at source farm a had total number of bacteria 2700 and at the end of the line it was 27000 almost that means it was at the source and this is at the end of the line that means the birds are consuming this much of bacteria when they consume one ml of drinking water now consider farm c it has an excellent source. There is no bacteria present at source, but we find almost almost five million bacteria at the end of the line. So if we compare source A and source C, definitely source A is better than source C, because source C supplies the bacteria to the bacteria to the birds, comparatively more number of bacteria to the birds. So this is not at all a desirable condition. That means there is a severe problem with the water management system. Either there is a problem with the drinker, or there may be there may be problem with the over tank or the pipeline. There, 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 or maybe at the nipple, whatever it may be. But the problem is there, and this problem has led to such a huge number of bacterial buildup at the end of the line. And this is an area actually which may suffer if there is shallow knowledge in the minds of the worker about the quality of the water. If there is less workforce involved because there will be time required for cleaning of the drinking lines and the drinkers on a regular basis. And these are the areas where every entrepreneur should pay attention to from now onwards. Because when there were plenty of workers, then also we could see that the drinker is not managed properly. We could find that the 
liters from fecal materials are are there on you know in the drinkers or the nipple line is not really clean to that extent so if this is the situation prevailing when there was uh, ample and there was no paucity of workforces then during the period when 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 we expect some shortage in manpower some shortage in the skilled laborers these problems must not repeat itself in order to increase the efficiency of production now this is the situation actually which is causing this huge number of bacterial built up at the end of the nipple line this is the development of the biofilms so these biofilms actually these are nothing but some sort of you know the slimy materials they develop inside the pipeline and there are certain materials for example pvc which promote the entrapment of the pathogens these pathogens they are mostly pseudomonas sometimes there will be campylobacter and 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 many other bacteria and this becomes a situation when the cross section of a pipe line is seen so if we look at this this has lot of impacts lot of impacts for example if this is the diameter original diameter so the original diameter has been reduced to this one and if we consider that this is going to be the situation prevailing in the next few months when the temperature is very high humidity is very high the birds need water so the birds will not get enough of water as it should just because of a clogged pipe line and whatever water the birds are getting that water is containing or loaded with good number of bacteria so these are the bacteria which may be present in this biofilms these are the bacteria these bacteria they 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 are the they are the causes of say cholibacillosis avian cholera all typhoid all cholera even viral diseases like newcastle disease infectious bronchitis so and so forth and just have a look at the root of infection the root of infection is mostly the fecal oral contamination this fecal oral contamination is the greatest root cause for spreading of this bacterial diseases and if bacterial diseases are there just because of mismanagement of the water resource or so mismanagement of of watering system of the birds this is going to be very unfortunate and this is going to be impact the performance of the flock to a huge extent because we have already the threat for the mycotoxin we have already the threat for the hot and humid climatic condition the intestine is likely to be damaged to a great extent and if we cannot check the quality of the water if we cannot control the quality of the water the impending disbursis cannot be prevented and if there is any shift in the uh, you know that microbial dynamics from eubiasis to dysbiosis uh, the situation is not going to be good enough and it should go out of control so one of the ways is to shock the water reservoirs shocking water reservoir is very simple that means when the baby chicks are being placed at the beginning of their life when the baby chicks are placed the water reservoir should be closed the entire system should be closed it should be filled up with some organic acids and chlorine at least for one and half hour then it should be purged with hydrogen peroxide and then the solution should stand in the over a tank or the or the or the or the main tank and in the pipelines for at least 24 to 48 hours and then it should be flushed this is one of the ways which can be done with the help of say reduced workforces uh even with unskilled workforces which can be done and which can take care of the quality of the drinking water at least for a broiler farm uh from say around say 30 35 days but at the same time there should be some sort of you know disinfectant to be present in the in the main source continuously but this practice cannot be done in a parent stock farm or in a laying hen farm so this is this is this is a bit difficult to implement in the laying farms or parent stock farms where whatever whatever operation needs to be done that should be done in the night only when the birds are off fed when the birds are rather sleeping uh, then only some short uh, scale some some i guess uh, some sort of a short scale measurement can be taken just to clean the pipelines <clears throat> well another another time for poll here now <clears throat> thank you sir for uh, uh, showing your throwing your insights on one of the most important nutrient and often forgotten nutrient water right and right. Uh, also uh, thank you for uh, showing us 
uh, you know the how to take care of the hidden danger which is biofilms now before going to the next segment uh, i would like to invite your attention towards the poll question so you can see one question uh, which is related to the next segment do you take care of or advise drinker height and position time to time based on different age groups of birds as we know even if we provide good quality water that drinker height and position is very important so do you advise the change in the height or position so the answers that you can give are yes no or not sure we can have 10 seconds to answer this and we can quickly go back to uh, dr sudipto haldas presentation uh sir again it is uh, more or less unanimous that everyone mostly 96 percent of the people are uh, they advise or they take care of the drinker height and position uh, a four percentage of the audience are not sure about it so that was our cue for the next segment sir. so anyway so since this is an unanimous decision that yes the drinker management or the feeder management is mandatory so my my job becomes easier but anyway, there are, there are some basic points which actually, basically what I'm trying to do is just to make people uh, reminded of the basic duties which um, which which may be overlooked, which may be overlooked uh, since we are, we, are, we are trying to emphasize upon all the points which can contribute to increasing the efficiency of the operation. For example, these are the distribution of feed in the feeder when the baby chick arrives at the farm. The sparse distribution of feed. This sparse distribution of feed is not going to help the birds. The birds should have ad libitum access to feed. The ad libitum access to feed that is very much important so that the birds can 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 uh, get the feed immediately as and when it it wants. This is another situation where the where the lighting is so much inadequate at the beginning at the very beginning that the birds will not. Uh, be interested, would not feel interested to go to the feeder and consume the feed. Basically, the thumb rule is that there should be at least uh, five blocks of uh, intensity, light intensity, which should be present at the level of the feeder. So that intensity of light is sufficient to attract the, or you can say that that keep the keep the chicks active, uh, and so that they move to the feeder and they consume the feed. One point is to be kept in mind that unless there is feed intake, we cannot expect good body weight. We cannot expect the desired level of genetic potential from the bird. So by hook or crook, we need to ensure that the birds consume sufficient quantity of feed. So that is that is for sure. And that, that needs to be taken care of by everybody. See, within seven days, the body weight should be four times of the initial body weight. That means if the chick is having a 40 grams of body weight, by seven days it should be 160 grams. And to achieve that one, we need to ensure that the chicks have ad libitum access to feed. So this is an example that how the feed should be given for the chicks to consume. This is the, an ideal distribution of the feeder you know, when the chicks are there, when the chicks are arriving in the in the broiler house. So these are the basic points, very basic points. We generally follow, but sometimes we forget, sometimes we overlook. And this and, and overlooking this very petty points leads to a good loss of performance at the end. Similarly, this is the drinker management. Drinker management, the height management of the drinker. So improper management may lead to spillage of water. And especially if we are talking about the wet litter condition, this wet litter condition can be exacer exacerbated if the birds have to practice some sort of exercise to reach the drinker and they spill the drinker, spill the water onto the litter material. So finally, the objective would be to reduce the wet litter by any means. And for that, and a proper drinker management is extremely necessary. Look at these drinkers, the quality of the drinkers. These are not of good quality. If we consider the roots of the bacterial infection, mostly they are, they are showing that there will be fecal oral contamination for most of the bacterial infections. So if the fecal oral contamination route is there, and if this is the condition of the drinker, so we cannot guarantee that the fecal oral contamination of water 
of infections will not take place. Despite usage of any antibiotic, sorry, any 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 water sanitizer, or you know that uh, any other measure that can uh, that 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 are generally aimed to improve the quality of water. So this is a very basic point. This is a very basic point, and that should be kept in mind. But this is going to be a problem again when there is shortage of workers. There is shortage of workforce, so there will be excuse for the from the for the workers who are working in the farm that since there is no worker, we cannot clean the drinker properly. I don't know that how to sort sort out this problem, but this is a point that needs to be kept in mind everywhere in every broiler farming operation, or or even in the beer farming operation that if the drinker is not managed properly the quality of water will be spoiled. Whatever good quality we give at the source, the quality the birds receive, birds receive will not be of optimum one. Now let me let me conclude gradually that we we should not, and this conclusion should be based on certain statistics. Now this COVID-19 pandemic, yes, this 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 was a disaster for everybody. For everybody, this was a disaster. But it, it may not be may not be that disaster what we are we are thinking about, especially for us those who are in the business of human food. We are not into automobiles. We are not into aviation. We are not into hotel and tourism industry directly, but we are into a business which provides food to human beings. And 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 so long human beings are there, the demand for food will be there. So this situation, this situation of this COVID-19 pandemic should not be taken as a curse. Rather, we can think if we can take this as a blessing in disguise. For example, it was predicted that by 2023, the compounded annual growth rate for this livestock and poultry industry should be around 4%. And in fact, in 2019, it was almost 3%. Now, during, during, during this period, during this period, up to say that for the first six months, there was a we can say that this is a lull period, but I'm talking about the global demand. If it is a global demand, and and if we consider the 37 percent of this growth will be originating from the Asia Pacific region, and one of the key drivers will be demand for clean milk. This is going to be a very crucial point for everybody. The demand for clean milk. That means we need a meat which is clean. When a consumer consumes the, this meat, he will have some sort of satisfaction that yes, I'm consuming something which is not going to, which is not going to put me in front of any risk factor. There will be no risk of antibiotic. There will be no risk of any infection. And whatever I'm going to eat, it is giving me something worthy. So this is the main driving force for this growth, and probably. It will not be a very big problem in achieving this growth rate, considering the way we are we are we are forwarding now. I'm not sure again that how long this trend will continue, but let us hope for the best one. So the overall the situation is difficult, but we can overcome this situation. Of course, we can overcome this situation. What we need is an extreme awareness, extreme awareness about what's happening worldwide, what's happening at the micro level by our side. If we find that, yes, uh, say around, around say 500 meters away, there is a farm where there is unusual mortality happening, we should be cautious. We should, we should stop the movement of the workers. We should stop the movement of, uh, you know, that vehicles which may visit that farm and my farm. So this awareness is very much needed. At the same time, we should be kept our, we should keep ourselves updated about all the latest developments of what's happening around and what may be the predictions, what may be the what are the statistics saying about you know the future growth and the future pattern of growth, etc. And the another point which is very much important is just to maximize the profit, a perfect cost calculation of all the business components is needed. We generally overlook number of components. We do not consider that what should be, for example, I'm a manufacturer of feed. I'm an I'm an integrator. I'm an integrator. I am I'm just I'm just preparing the feed. We consider grossly the cost of raw material, the cost of production, the cost of labor, the cost of bags, blah blah blah. 
but are we really considering that what is the what is the cost of producing a good quality steam or how much i am losing by producing a bad quality steam we generally do not but this is a very 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 petty component i'm talking about but now the time has come that if you want to maximize the profit if you want to optimize your operation then all these minor components has to be considered and there has they, they they must be summed up in order to finally calculate the target cost of any business operation now we need some extremely alert and technically sound managers at all the people levels yes this is going to be very important because we are going to lose a good number of skilled workers we may need to operate we may need to run our show with the help of some unskilled or even semi skilled workers workers so we need very very sound and alert managers at all these positions who will who will who will report any any observation anything anything any any deviation to the higher authority and the higher authority should report or should take a decision immediately for the immediate implementation of the strategy planning so this is this is a very very crucial part of the future planning and of course finally we must say no to the compromisation with speed and food safety as well as biosecurity because if there is any breach in the food safety and the fit safety norms and if there is any breach in the biosecurity we are gone we are finished. thank you very much thank you so much sir that was a very elaborate uh, presentation from you covering a you. range of topics uh, starting from the impending mycotoxin problems due to the rattle supply chain uh, leading to gut health problems then the early chick care then the water quality and even the practical tips on uh, the feeder and drinker positions uh, it's extremely practicable and uh, it's so elaborate that uh, i feel that it's humanly impossible to grab all the information that you have provided i'm very sure the audience will keep this recording of this video in the, as a video library uh, in their records and this can be used again and again as it's very very pertinent information that you have shared sir uh, a proof of how good this session has been is uh, you know evident from the number of questions that we have received and it's keeping on uh, coming so um, as a moderator i would like to you know sort out the questions uh, which many people have asked like as in a uh, percentage so uh, one major question that had come uh, which many others have asked also this was first asked by dr amit lavanya uh, the question is um, so as we know that during this high ambient temperature and relative humidity uh, the wet litter problem is encountered and there is quite a number of mortality happening in farms uh so how we can reduce this mortality due to this wet litter problems yes so so actually actually the answer to this question is is distributed in in throughout throughout the presentation in fact means we need to find out that what is the exact reason for this wet litter the wet litter is if it is in summer months if it is in summer months i, I think our if the if the question is Uh, particularly indicating towards the wet litter problem in the summer months or what? Yes, sir. Summer and hot humid months. Summer and hot humid months. Exactly. In the summer and hot humid months, wet litter is going to be a big problem. As I was discussing, that uh, what we we call it as a third quarter syndrome. Yes. Especially in 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 the part of uh, Philippines and Vietnam area, this is a this is a disease to be honest. Okay. this third quarter syndrome that what happens the birds consume a lot of water because they they do pant but they cannot evaporate uh, the heat so they drink water and this this leads to the wet litter problem and why mortality happens this mortality is happening just because of the extreme of the heat stress now here the question is that at what is the mortality is happening the mortality is expected especially during the winter age if the stocking density is quite high if if the birds are found to be stressed and you know that if wet litter problem is not rectified properly so that will lead to even ammonia build up if ammonia build up is there so there will automatically be irritation on the you know that uh, respiratory tract so the birds will have some problem in breathing and if ventilation is improper there is not enough movement of air 
in the farm. So these are all clubbed together, you know. So these are all clubbed together, and finally this leads to insufficient oxygen supply to the birds. And if, if you if you perform postmortem examinations, in many cases you will find that there will be some sort of cyanosis, or even sometimes a heart gets ruptured, or or some some symptoms like this. So uh, very difficult to pinpoint the exact reason, but this is sort of you know the cumulative effect, and probably taking care of all these points should 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 uh, take care of this. As I said, that there should be something in the feed which can control this non specific diarrhea. So that, that's that's one of the factors which can control this very little. Thank you, sir. Uh, so there has been uh, some questions uh, which is uh, there in the mind of many people, I, I believe. There are lots of questions that come in the same context. Uh, when there is a diarrhea in a, in a poultry farm, how can we differentiate whether it is an infectious or non-infectious? It's quite a practical situation. Uh, is there any, any way of identifying for a, for a layman also? Is it possible? It's, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very crude method, I'm telling you. Very crude method. Yes, you take the fetal material in your hand. Just squeeze it roughly. Take the feces between your fingers, squeeze it very roughly. Just wash up your hand with running water. Not take the smell. If the smell is there, then it is infection. That smell will remain for at least three days. And if there is no smell, the smell goes off with, as you wash your hand, that is non infectious in the It's a very crude method to understand, but this is, I'm telling you, 100% correct method. Right. If there is fish smell, if there is bad smell, and that smell doesn't go off by washing your hands with plain water, that means it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a non infectious origin, and if the smell is there, it's infection. Very good method, but it's not. Right, so it's a very, very practicable solution. Uh, yeah. I think all our, all our audience will uh, can try that. Uh, so there has been uh, a very another. Use your, use your left hand. Use your left hand because if you use your right hand, you can't take your foot. <laughs> very true. So that's <laughs> a practical uh, solution and an advice. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, there is another very, very um, pertinent question uh, from Doctor. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there any uh, way to supplement the day-old chicks during uh, extended transit time? Yeah, there, there, there are ways. You know that there are ways. If, if I if I come to know that there will be some delay in transit, so nowadays there are so many products available uh, uh, which come in the form of tubes or in the form of jelly, which provides a lot of nutrients, provide a lot of uh, you know that water, so that is a mandatory because you know that we we sometimes provide that watermelon. W what for? Because the bird will get some sort of water. Because we are concerned here about the dehydration, we must prevent the dehydration. But if we were expecting delay in reaching the farm, then we should provide some food as well. So there are nowadays products available. So those products can be put in the chick basket. So the birds will simply pick up those products and they will get water as well as nutrients. So that's a very easy method. That's a very easy method, and that should be practiced, to be honest, especially in this hot and humid summer months. Yeah. Yes. Uh, sir, again, uh, another practical question from Dr. Boreddi Ashok Reddy. The question is how frequently we should wash pipelines in layer farms? Any time interval for washing, and probably some advice on which disinfectant should be used, especially probably in the light of biofilms, sir. Honestly speaking, uh, honestly speaking, it's really difficult to uh, clean the biofilms in the laying, laying in the in the layer farms when the birds are there because 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 for uh, good cleaning we need at least 24 to 48 hours of holding time. So if this 24 to 48 hours of holding time cannot be given, the biofilms cannot be removed. And practically speaking, in the laying farms, in the layer farms, it is it is really difficult to use. That strategy, that shock strategy, what I was talking about, this is possible only in case of broiler farms. But for the layer farms, only the regular disinfection, only the regular cleaning is there. And there are some descaling materials available. I, 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 I don't remember the names actually. So, uh, don't you know, remember the name. But there are some descaling materials available which can be used because I can remember that in uh, in in earlier days, means when I was into the direct operation of a laying, laying farm. So we used to keep this uh, material in the overhead tanks 
in the night time only just flush it when the hens were sleeping and then again we keep the ready we used to keep the ready uh, keep keep the uh, pipeline ready by morning before the hens start drinking again so i'm sorry that i cannot provide any any accurate guideline in this regard sure sir so another one of the practical questions that we usually encounter uh, this question has been asked by vijay kumar um, so what is your opinion if we use acidifier and chlorine tablet both uh, would this be a better uh, strategy for water sanitation of course of course because chlorine tablets they do not work if the ph is not reduced for the chlorine tablet to work properly the ph must be the ph of water must be below 5 if it remains in 4 to 5 it works the best so if i add chlorine tablet uh, with ph say around 7 it will not work so there are two strategy basically the one strategy is to reduce the total dissolved solids it should be below 500 and then the ph should be reduced to around 5 then add chlorine tablet and then this will work nicely right so another one of the most frequently asked questions in the current times this question is from big vijay singh how we can manage gut health without antibiotic growth promoters in broilers or layers uh, of he hasn't mentioned uh, especially in so we can take broiler as an example here let's take broiler because for the layers uh, we can we can discuss later on yes. uh, if we if we want to manage the broilers without <laughs> antibiotic growth promoter see this is possible if we maintain some basic steps in biosecurity we need to we need to confirm that what are the roots of infection the roots of infection are drinking water the roots of infection may be you know the workers who are working there the roots of infection may be the litter material and uh, feed should not be considered as a source of infection because the feed is pelleted and bacterial growth is most unlikely in feed so if these are the sources of infection and if we work on these sources then probably we can control the entry of bacterial infections into the bird system now the question comes that if we use we cannot rule out actually the subclinical infections for example if our broiler house is uh, you know that dissolved means after harvesting we cannot rule out the presence of some remnant of the bacterial species in the house so for this the extensive cleaning is necessary and you know that these are all non-specific concepts i understand but this is true that if we are really serious about uh, rearing the birds without antibiotic then by taking some very basic biosecurity measures it is probably possible because one point is very important that the dose level of antibiotic growth promoters that we are using are they really really uh, working or is there any sort of uh, we are using this as a preventive measure but how efficient they are actually so these are a lot of this is a i think that should be a separate discussion yes yes sir yeah uh, sir due to paucity of time we will take one last question sir uh, Correct. Uh, and this is also a frequently asked question when we use unconventional feed stuff. This question is from uh, Mr. Anupam Kumar. MBM and leather meal can cause toxicity in birds as per his practical observation. How to neutralize it in affected birds? MBM and leather meal, the toxicity will be caused just because of decomposition. If it is decomposed, first of all, leather meal must not be used in broiler chickens. Or even layer chickens. It is better not to use anything. Better to use something, say something, say say sand instead of leather meal. I'm I'm telling you very frankly. This is my frank opinion. Please don't use leather meal. It doesn't make any sense because its digestibility is just virtually zero. If anybody wants, I can I can I can share the digestibility figures as well. So leather meal must be avoided. Better not to use this one. Just just to increase the crude protein content. Uh, you are putting, you are inviting a lot of risk. Now, coming to MBM, there is a huge possibility that the MBM gets decomposed. So again, you need to take the help of your smell. If you find the smell is there, something unusual smell, the MBM is decomposed. And if it is decomposed, you never know that what is going to be there in the meal. If there are toxins already developed by 
the bacteria which are present there. You are gone. You cannot prevent the consequences. But there are some prevention. If you go for the decomposition test, that decomposition test can help you in understanding whether the MBM is decomposed or not. And then you can avoid the usage of that particular MBM lot. That is the only way. But if toxicity sets in, there is no other way but to but to uh, you know go 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 with that toxicity. There is no other way. Right. Thank you so much, sir, for your frank opinions. Very, uh, very uh, valuable suggestions. Um, I think we have taken uh, quite a lot of time, uh, both for the session as well as the questions. Uh, right. I would like to thank you, sir, uh, from the bottom of my, my heart to uh, you know, you make this you. program a grand success, uh, which is quite evident with the number of chats, the questions, the audience, uh, you know, interactions. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramya. Thank the audience uh, who has come from uh, you know various parts of the globe, and uh, thank you so much for attending uh, this webinar. Uh, I have to apologize for one thing that you know since there were a lot of influx of questions, uh, many questions uh, you know were very pertinent, so we could kind of create a sample of those questions and try to get the answer uh, from our expert. Uh, still, all of your questions. We assure you all of your questions will be answered uh, through the email uh, you know which you have provided while registering for this event uh, if you have any other feedback or any further questions uh, you can uh, ask our local representatives uh, we have our country managers in your uh, locations outside india and uh, you know our local representatives within india or you can write uh, write to us to raina.r at naturalremedy.com uh, I will be very happy to receive your feedback as well as questions or any uh, such suggestions from your side. And we will be very happy to answer you uh, back at the earliest. Thank you so much. Uh, have a great day ahead. Thank you.